Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series Catechism. At BRCC, we believe that our catechism is a useful tool to help us understand and grow in our faith. But why? Find out in our series Catechism. We're going to be talking this morning about our perfectly righteous Redeemer. We're just taking a few weeks here where we are going over some questions out of our catechism that are kind of the basics, uh, the foundations of the Christian faith, and we're kind of looking at what it, what it means for Christ to be our Redeemer. And so this morning we're going to be looking actually at three passages of Scripture that kind of bring this up, that I'll be rooting everything in these texts. Uh, they're going to be in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, and then 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. They're going to be on the screen. They're also in the booklet, and you can follow along in your Bible. I encourage you now to hear the word of the living, sovereign, perfect God. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. In Hebrews chapter 2, for this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. May God bless his holy word. There's a man named Reuben Anaja. You've probably not heard of him. He's a Filipino man. He was a construction worker. And many years ago, he had an accident and he fell down a, a unfinished building. He fell down from where he was working Everyone thought it was going to kill him, but somehow he actually unexpectedly survived the fall. And Reuben was very, very grateful to God for this, and he decided, for some reason, to show his gratitude to God that on every Good Friday, he would allow himself to be crucified. And so for 33 years, from 1985 to 2019, every year... He was actually literally nailed to a cross in the Philippines. Now, I bring this story up not because Bay Ridge is planning on asking everybody to do that this Good Friday, because we are in fact not, but to ask a question. This is obviously, we would say, uh, you know, you, it's good that you want to give gratitude to God. Crucifying yourself is not the way to actually do that, but it brings up a question for us. This man has crucified himself 33 times, and yet it doesn't remove anyone's sin. Why is it that the death of Jesus, we are saying, removes our sin? The fact is there are many people, there were many Jews in the time of Rome that were crucified, and unlike Reuben, they weren't crucified for a few hours, they were crucified until they died. Uh, Many of them died. There were even many good people who died. There are many martyrs in the history of the church, and there were martyrs in Israel that died. Why is it that none of their deaths could work salvation, redemption for you and me? What is required so that one can serve as a redeemer and as a mediator between God and humanity? What's required for him to do this? Now, if you remember, kind of, I'm, I'm building this, you know, week upon week, and a couple of weeks ago in question 21, we had asked ourselves, what sort of redeemer and mediator is needed to bring us back to God? And the answer was one who is perfectly righteous, truly human, and truly God. If someone is, you know, like an angel that's not sent can't redeem us because they have to be truly human. So last week we unpacked a little bit about what it meant to be truly human. We're going to see in a future teaching what it means to be truly God, but this week we're going to focus on that first phrase, what it means to be perfectly righteous. 
and why this is important. Why must the Redeemer be perfectly righteous? The Redeemer must be perfectly righteous so that his obedience and sacrifice in our place will be acceptable to God. So let's dive in and take a look at this. The first thing about the Redeemer that we need to be paying attention to is that uh, there's a phrase that comes out of an old hymn, in our place he stood. That to be the Redeemer, Jesus has to be the second Adam who stands in our place. And you remember we went over this some last week. I tried to stress this a little bit both in the Sunday teaching and then also even in after hours, which you can you can look up. But we have to note that the Redeemer, uh, to be perfectly righteous, one phrase here is that he's doing this in our place. In other words, it's not enough that he's righteous on his own, and we're going to see in a moment that he dies, but he has to do it in our place for us. And there's two components, two parts, again, that we looked at last week of Jesus doing this in our place. And those two components are summed up in the words obedience and sacrifice. Jesus has to do this. Uh, he has to be in our place in obedience and then in sacrifice. Notice first, Jesus obeyed in our place, keeping God's law for us so that his righteousness could be given to us. So in Romans 5.19, our text that we've looked at several times in the last few weeks, Paul says, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. And I point out that obedience, the real contrast here is not one act of sin versus one act of obedience. It is one man who sinned, who trespassed, versus one man who obeyed. And so Jesus' obedience does include the cross, but it is more than the cross. It means that Christ obeyed for 33 years and he did it in your place and in mine. So the first problem with Reuben and Naja there in the Philippines is he has no righteousness to give to you or I. Okay? He, he even picked that he was doing it for 33 years and he was asking somebody to take on because he said, well, Jesus lived for 33 years and he's correct. But the difference is Jesus lived in perfect obedience. And I don't know Reuben Anaja, but I do know this. He has not lived in perfect obedience. And therefore, he has no righteousness to offer to you or I. We have to have a Redeemer who can obey in our place. Now, we sing this in some of our worship songs. And I encourage you, each Sunday as we are singing, pay attention to what we sing. Don't just kind of go along with the melody or whatever. We need to think deeply about what we are singing. Last week, we sang the song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, one of my favorite worship songs today. And there's a line in there that speaks to this. It says, see the true and better Adam come to save the hellbound man. Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law, in him we stand. Hear what that song is saying. Every time we sing this, we're singing about this thing of obedience, that there's a true and a better Adam, the second Adam, and he has come to save us. We were bound for hell. He's come to save us. And how did he do that? He is the great and sure fulfillment of the law. Everything the law required, Jesus did, and therefore it's in him we stand. If we are in him, we are given the righteousness of God. So the first thing is that he has to stand in our place in obedience. Secondly, he has to stand in our place by suffering and being sacrificed to take the punishment that we were due. Notice in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it's speaking about Christ and his humanity. He he had to be made like us uh, in every way. And notice the final phrase. He did this, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And so Jesus has to be truly and fully human so that he can atone for our sins. And see, here's the other difference. Reuben Anaja not only did not live in perfect obedience to God, his death cannot atone for sin. Because he has not been perfectly righteous, All he could hope to do was to begin to pay for his own sins. 
But Jesus doesn't have to do that. He has a perfect righteousness, and therefore, any suffering he does is not for his sin, but for ours. And the word atonement, the, the NIV translates it as atonement there. Some older translations have the word propitiation, which is not a word we use very often today. But propitiation means to appease the wrath, to take the wrath that was due to somebody. Uh, in particular, in this case, to appease the wrath of God. Now, when I say that, that is very unpopular today. People do not want to hear that God has any wrath towards sin. And I'm not even just talking about unbelievers. Many Christians don't want to hear that. A famous uh, theologian named C.H. Dodd, he hated that the idea was propitiation. He said that was an idea that was rubbish, was his words. That God would have any wrath towards us. He said that was unworthy of a biblical picture of God. But C.H. Dodd was wrong. I actually love that another theologian wrote a limerick. It was kind of a, a slap down on C.H. Dodd. And he said, there once was a man named uh, Dodd whose name, if you please, was spelled with two D's, because it's D-O-D-D, -D, uh, when one was sufficient for God. <laughs> and the idea was Dodd thought he was smarter than God. And I got news for him, he's not. Because the scripture is really clear that Jesus' death was to bear punishment. I could go many places, I'll just take one. Isaiah chapter 53, which is a depiction of Christ's death in our place. And there's no debate whether it is, because the New Testament tells us on multiple occasions that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus. And in Isaiah 53, 5, it says this, but he, speaking of Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Notice, there, he is pierced. He is crushed. He is punished. He is wounded. And that is done for our transgressions, our iniquities. It's our sin. Isaiah is saying very clearly, Jesus, it was not a mistake. It wasn't, oops, it slipped up here. It wasn't just a sad, tragic event. Jesus is being pierced for my sin. He is being punished for my sin. He is doing it in my place. And that is what atonement is. It is suffering in my place so that I might be released. And we sing this as well. In another great modern hymn, uh, the song In Christ Alone, we sing this when we sing this song fairly regularly. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. Okay, now, when I told you a minute ago that some Christians don't like this, there was a big furor a few years ago because certain groups wanted to start singing this song, and they wrote to Keith Getty, who had written the song, and they said, we want to change it to say, till on that cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. And Keith Getty said, well, the love of God was magnified, but the wrath of God was satisfied. And they said, no, there is no wrath of God towards our sin. Open your Bible, okay? And if Jesus did not bear the wrath of God, friend, it's still due to you. And it's still due to me. There are people who don't see how that's good news. It's very good news that he has drank the cup. And he's emptied it in my place. In my place he stood. See, Reuben and Aja cannot do that. I cannot do that. Someone else cannot do it. We cannot even pay the penalty for our own sins. But because Jesus was perfect and obeyed perfectly, he was able to drink the full cup of the wrath of the fury of God. And he did it in our 
place. So the Redeemer has to obey and be sacrificed in our place so that our sins can be forgiven and so that we can be restored to relationship with God. Now, this brings up why he has to be a perfectly righteous Redeemer. And we see this in our third text that we're looking at, which is 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter here says, notice what he says about Jesus. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold. I love that. Okay? Not perishable things such as silver or gold. What did they think about silver and gold in the ancient world? There was nothing that was better. And Peter says, this look, it's not with something worthless like all the wealth of Jeff Bezos. It's not something like that. that that's nothing. That's not what could redeem you. Because what we're going to see and when we look at Jesus needing to be God, Jeff Bezos couldn't begin to pay off the penalty for your sin. Nor mine. Not with every dime he's got. Not all the gold and silver in the world. So Peter says, it's not with something that's perishable, some trashy thing like, I don't know, gold that you were bought, but rather that, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed out from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. See, gold, worthless. Silver, worthless. Precious blood of Christ, priceless. Okay, see, MasterCard, you know the MasterCard commercial, you know, you want to do this and it costs this and it costs this, but what you get is priceless, which isn't really true, because whatever you can get with the MasterCard is not priceless, okay? What is priceless is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That is truly Priceless. And notice he says it's the precious blood of Christ because he's a lamb without blemish or defect. So what he's saying is he's a lamb that is perfect, which is why his blood is precious. If he had sinned, his blood is not precious. It's just regular old human blood. But because he is sinless, it is precious. And so it refers to the fact here when, when Peter says the precious blood of Christ, the lamb without blemish or defect, he's referring to the fact that Jesus is sinless and therefore can offer himself as a payment for our sin. Another verse we've looked at a couple times in the last couple weeks is in Hebrews chapter 7, where the writer has been going through and laying out how Jesus is the sacrifice and he's also our priest. And notice he tells us in verses 26 and 27 in Hebrews 7, he says, such a high priest meets our needs, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. I mean, notice he's, he's adding all of these words in because he's wanting to say whatever way you want to look at it, Jesus is different from us. He's set apart from us. He's pure. He's blameless. He's holy. And that is what we need. And so he says in verse 27, unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, he sacrificed for their sins once for all. Why is Jesus able to do it once for all? Because he's offering a pure sacrifice. Why is he able to offer for us? Because he doesn't have to pay for his own sins first. His suffering is purely in your behalf and in my behalf. If I suffer, think of this, friends. If I were to reject the sacrifice of Christ, how long does the scripture say, I will bear the penalty of my sin in hell? Forever and ever and ever. That's how steep the debt is. It will never, ever, ever be paid. But the writer to Hebrews says, but do you understand when you have a perfect holy, spotless, blameless, set apart from sinner's lamb, and he suffers in a day it's done, once and for all. And so this is what he's telling us. Now, all of this is language that's coming out of the Old Testament that was used for sacrificial animals. 
Okay, so it's not that the New Testament said, well, the Redeemer had to be perfect in righteousness. No, that's, that's throughout the scripture we're told that. So if we go all the way back to the Levitical law, the whole book of Leviticus really deals with holiness. It deals with God's call and it deals with the sacrificial system. And right at the very beginning, we get a couple of verses of introducing the book. And then here's what we get right off the bat. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without what? Defect. Defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of the meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. So it's got to be without defect. It's got to be offered at the right place or else it's not acceptable. It doesn't accomplish anything. And then he is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Notice again, we got the idea of atonement. So what I would have to do is get a lamb without defect, one that was perfect, and bring it in. And I come, and the priest would take my hands, and he puts my hands on the head of the lamb. Why are we doing that? What's happening? I'm transferring my sin to the lamb. And then as I watch, what does the priest do with the lamb? He kills it. And how does he kill it? He slits its throat. And what gets all over me? Blood is everywhere. You got, you got to see, see, we go into Safeway or Sam's or Giant and we buy meat and it's wrapped in cellophane, right? And I think the average American today think it like grows on a tree somewhere. You just pluck it off and you put it in the refrigerator, right? Not how it happens. I can assure you, having grown up on a farm, it's a bloody business. And you had to stand there and transfer your sin over to this lamb, and they slice its throat. And you realize, that's what I was due. But this lamb took my place. Peter and the writer to Hebrews say, we've got the real lamb. Those lambs could never take away sin, which is why you had to, I did it today, I got to come back again and do it again. And then I got to come back and do it again. Because they could never actually remove sin. But this lamb removes my sin once for all. So the scripture is saying that Jesus is the spotless lamb of God who takes our sin upon himself, bearing the punishment we were due. And the amazing thing in this case is, when I put my hands on him by faith, so to speak, my sin is transferred to him, and what do I get back? Righteousness. Pure, holy, spotless righteousness. He bears wrath, I get blessing. He is forsaken, I am adopted. That's what happens in that moment. This is what Christ has done for us. Now, when we say this today, there are many who would come back and say, why? What what difference does it make? Is sin that big a deal? I remind you of what we were praying for a few moments ago. Yes, it is a big deal. That's where sin leads. But I want you to see that there's a reason behind this. Humans owe God perfect obedience. So the Redeemer must be perfect. But there are people, why? Because of the very nature and character of God. That is why. Much earlier in the Catechism, we had a couple of questions that were about this, but they're kind of the foundation and basis. In question seven, we say, what is God's character like? God is perfect in holiness, love, and integrity. It means he is pure, holy, set apart, transcendent. He is loving, good, merciful, kind, and he is true and faithful, and first off, he is true and faithful to his own character. He does not change. See, we think, why is it a big deal? God needs to get with the times. That's what our culture thinks. God's got to get on the right side of history. And God says, I change for no man. I have no need to change because I am perfect And therefore, if I change, 
it automatically is a change to imperfection. And then God, the next question is, what does God demand of humans? What does he demand of me? God demands that I be perfect in holiness, love, and integrity. Because whose image was I made in? God's image. See, a, a dog doesn't have to be perfect. It's not in God's image. But we are in the image of God. And therefore, as the image of God, we must be like him. We uh, and the law in the Old Testament is a reflection of God's character. Now, we need to see and understand this because today, people like to focus on the fact that God is love. And is God love? Yes, thanks. Be to God, he is love. But understand this, he is holy. Again, I will tell you, I even have Christians, hear Christians say today, yes, but the Bible says God is love. And I say, yes, it does. Two times and hundreds of times, it says the Lord is holy. In fact, the only character attribute that is stressed, you know, the Bible likes numbers, right? So if you hear something three times in a row, it's telling you this is the utmost. Guess what's the only character attribute that is ever given three times? Yes, and not only is that done once, but we get a picture in the Old Testament in Isaiah's vision into heaven, and we get a picture in John's vision in the New Testament into heaven, and what is it that the angels are saying about God? Love, love, love? <laughs> See, our modern world wants to say that, but they get in there and we are told they are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And in fact, what are the angels doing? We're told they got six wings, and what are they having to do? They're having, they're having to cover their eyes because they can't bear to look at the blinding holiness of God. And Isaiah the prophet sees this, and he says, this is awesome. I'm going to write a bestseller out of this. What it was like when I went to heaven. Is that what Isaiah says? What does Isaiah say? Woe is me. I am ruined. I am undone. I'm coming apart just from seeing the vision. When John sees Jesus in the book of Revelation, John, the disciple who loved Jesus, who laid his head on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper, when he sees Jesus in all of his glory and all of his purity and all of his holiness, what does John do? I fell at his feet as though dead. See, God is love, friends. Never lose that. But God is holy. And God does not change. There have been periods of time that people so stressed the holiness of God, the love of God got lost. And that's a tragedy. And there are times, like today, our bigger dangers, we want to stress love because we like love. We like that attribute. We don't like holiness. In fact, if you are holy in our culture today, you're going to get canceled because we don't like it. We're not neutral towards it. We despise it. But God is perfect in holiness, love, and integrity. He does not change. What he was, he is. What he is, he will be forever. And so we need to understand that this means God does not abide sin. And it means God is not reading the polls we're doing. Saying, ugh, yeesh, I got I to gotta work on my PR. Not going to happen. He will not change to line up with us. He demands that we change to line up with him. And so the requirement for the Redeemer to be perfect, to be without sin, it's not something that's just arbitrary. It is rooted in the eternal, unchanging nature and character of God. That's why it requires perfection. Now, how do we apply this? What does this mean for us. The first thing is kind of 
going on that statement I just made. Do I see that redemption is required by God's perfect eternal character? See, the whole culture is going to keep telling you and me, and they undermine what redemption means and the uniqueness of what Jesus Christ. You, people, again, it's so narrow. How can you think Jesus is the only way? Because I know what's required. And when I understand what the requirement is, again, give it a shot. But you're not going to accomplish it. Nor am I, nor to be clear, is Muhammad or Buddha or any other religious leader. They are not going to accomplish it. They have their own sin. And they cannot bear the price of the wrath of God. So redemption is not some extra add-on. It is required by God's character and by our sin. If there is no redemption, you and I are lost. But so the temptation here is, see, and this is what happens. We squirm under that, and so the key is then I've got to change the character of God. Because if I can change the character of God, then maybe what's required in redemption can be changed. And that's exactly what goes on in our culture. We will distort God's character, and then what that does is it distorts the nature of sin, and it distorts the nature of salvation. I'm going to uh, unpack this a little bit more in after hours that I'll be recording a little bit later that'll pop out on Tuesday to get us to think about how these are all tied together. But we need to understand, God is perfect in holiness, love, and integrity, and that means he will judge all sin, but he will work to save sinners, and he will not change. There won't be a plan B. If we don't like the way he works, none of that's going to shift anything. God will judge sin, but he will work to save sinners, which he has done through Jesus Christ. And so any idea of redemption that discounts or dismisses any aspect of who God is, particularly in our day, holiness, and the unchanging character of God, and focuses exclusively on love so that sin's not a big deal, that is false. It's a false understanding of God. It's a false understanding of reality. It's a false understanding of right and wrong. It is a false understanding of sin, and therefore it's a false understanding of redemption and salvation. All of that flows from understanding God's character. Most important thing that you and I think about is what, how we understand who God is. Everything else will flow from that. And we live in an age that minimizes God. We don't see how holy God is. And therefore, we don't think much about the salvation he offers. Way back when we started this, I mentioned a theologian named Anselm, and he kept going back to that when as people were, you know, dialoguing with him and they're disagreeing with the great price he was talking about in redemption, he kept saying, you have not yet considered how great your sin is. Because you're not understanding. You're reducing God down. And so you don't think your sin's that bad. But your sin offends the infinite, sovereign, eternal creator and preserver of everything. It offends the holy God. And therefore, it is an infinite offense. And Anselm could tell him, you're not understanding because you're minimizing your sin because you don't realize how heinous it is. Now, second question for us when we come to the Lord's table is, do I see that redemption requires perfect obedience and suffering in my place? Because of the character of God, what's required is perfect obedience and suffering in my place. So the Old Testament uh, sacrificial system foreshadows to redemption that is found in the New Covenant. This is why we read the Old Testament and you see this. And people who want to deny any sense of sin being judged, they're just ignoring the Old Testament sacrificial system because it's quite clear what's going on there. And the New Testament statement, you remember right off the bat, when Jesus first appears in public and John the Baptist sees him, what does he say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what Jesus is. He's the Lamb who's going to take away sin. And so throughout the entire Old Testament, in the offering system, the Passover, everything else, a blemished animal could not become a substitute. 
It was not allowed. I mean, God even rebuked the people in Malachi uh, because he said, you all are bringing in these deformed animals. Try offering some of this stuff to the governor. See if he likes it. I'm the high king. You bring me your best. Because see, that's the temptation. Well, you know, I got this animal. Looks like this little lamb's only going to live a couple of weeks anyway. Let's go sacrifice that. And God says, no, you can't do that. The sacrifice must be perfect. And so because God is perfect in holiness, love, and integrity, and because he demands his image bearers be perfect in holiness, love, and integrity, the Redeemer must be perfect in holiness, love, and integrity. But here's the good news for you and me. What we celebrate in the gospel, what we celebrated in the coming of Christ, in his incarnation, and as we move through his life, what we are celebrating is that Jesus is the perfectly righteous redeemer. The good news is he has done that. What I cannot do, what I fail to do every day, Jesus has done. And he didn't give a good approximation of it. He did it absolutely perfectly. He is a lamb without spot or defect. He is a priest that is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. And he ever lives to intercede for you and me. And so when Satan, the accuser of the brothers, goes before our God, and we're told in Revelation he accuses us night and day, day. He never wears out. I get tired at night, fall asleep. He is still there accusing me. How can I have hope before the throne of God above? Because I have a strong and perfect plea. I have one who stands there 24-7 when Satan says, Look at all of the wickedness in Brett's heart and his words and in his actions. And Jesus says, you don't know the half of it. But I have borne wrath in his place. And he is covered in my righteousness. Get thee behind me. That is a strong and perfect plea, friends. And that's the good news. When we understand this, there is no more wrath of God for me. He has drank the cup to the dregs. He drained all the wrath of God, and then he fills my cup up with blessing. Every week, what do we say? Go forth, you are blessed, be a blessing, because my cup's never going to run dry, because the sinless Son of God has borne everything for me and gives me full blessings, and his sacrifice will never run dry, it will never have a bad day, it is eternally perfect and sufficient forever. It atones for our sin. It removes our sin. It purifies us from our sin, and it brings us before God. I could throw up the song we sang this morning, but please hear, before the throne of God above, we have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. Thanks be to God we have a high priest who does that, brothers and sisters. And so this morning, we're going to come to this table of redemption. We're going to hear, confess our sin. We're going to remember and confess the perfect redemption given by Christ. And we're going to come boldly to the throne of grace to receive help. Now what we're going to do, if you can stand with me, we're going to do in 1 John chapter 1 and into chapter 2. John deals with our sin. And there are some Christians or people who purported to be Christians that John was writing to this church. And he was saying, some of you all are trying to get out from under this by denying your own sin. You, you think the solution and the way forward is to minimize your own sin. And John says you can't do that. If you do that, you're making God out to be a liar. Friends, the good news is if we understand what Christ has done for us, I need not minimize my sin. I can own up 
to what my sin is because I know that his atoning death is more than enough for what we need. So we're going to put up on the screen and we're going to confess together. I'll be doing the part that says leader and then you can do the part which is the congregation. And this is just 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, going through chapter 2, verse 2. So let us confess our sins and the redemption that we are given in Christ together. Brothers and sisters, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness. We lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's be seated. If you have truly, in doing this, confessed your sin and also the redemption that is yours in his atoning work in your behalf, then I invite you to come boldly to receive from God's table this morning. For what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, let's come together in faith today proclaiming that Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection is more than enough for you and for me. Let's go ahead and take the bread. Father, you are the eternal, sovereign creator of everything. All that exists has come from you existing by and for your will and pleasure. We confess this is true for us, and we owe you our very life. We also confess that you are perfect in holiness, love, and integrity. As those who are made in your image, we were created to be perfect in holiness, love, and integrity as well. But Lord, we are at this table because we confess that we are sinful and unholy, deserving your just judgment for our sin. But we also confess and we thank you that Jesus is our perfect Redeemer who walked in perfect holiness, love, and integrity, and died to take the punishment we deserve. And so, Lord, confessing both our sin, but his overcoming redemption, we approach you now in confidence and faith, trusting his work in our place 
and his constant intercession in our behalf. Brothers and sisters, take the bread of life. Lord Jesus, you are our perfectly righteous redeemer. You are the spotless lamb of God, slain in our place. Through your blood, we are forgiven. We are cleansed. And we are made pure. The Father is pleased to look on you and your sacrifice and to pardon us. So we give you thanks for your blood shed for us. And we come boldly to this table, rejoicing in our salvation and receiving grace and strength to help us in our hour of need. Brothers and sisters, take the cup of life and drink. Let's stand together, and as we do each week, I encourage you, make this your own. Cry out along with me to ask the Spirit of God to implant this deeply in our hearts, seal it to us. Holy Spirit, we have celebrated this morning the great salvation that is ours in Christ. In Him, we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of sins. And all of this is in accordance with the riches of God's grace. When we believed in Christ, O oh Spirit, you came to dwell in us, marking us as God's people, sealing us for the day of redemption, keeping us for our eternal inheritance. And so today we rejoice in our status as the people of God. Spirit of God, come upon your people now. Fill us to overflowing. Empower us for sanctification, that we might be delivered from the sins that so easily beset us. Relentlessly work in us, so that we might be conformed to the image of our precious, perfect Redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you would do all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus, our perfect Redeemer and Mediator in whom we live. We ask this in his name and God's people say, Amen. 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 Brothers, I'm going to encourage uh, conclude again this week with the same benediction we had last week from the book of Revelation. I encourage you to hear and receive your status through the blood of Christ. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness the firstborn from among the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. For Jesus Christ loves us and he has freed us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom and to be priests to serve his God and Father to whom be glory now and forevermore. You are blessed. Go forth and be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.